All right, I guess I should probably grab a... I have ADD, so I need to move or um, it's not going to be good for anybody. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Everybody wave, say hi. Yay! Where, where's the overflow room in relation to here? Everybody wave that way. Hi, I don't know where the fuck everybody is, but okay. Um, so yeah, as Chris said, I'm John Vincent. I have no idea why he invited me to do this, but I'm doing it, and it's been a long time since I've spoken in front of a lot of people, and I'm really freaking out right now. So hi, make me feel good. Say good, yay! Um, if you haven't guessed, I'm from the States, and... <laughs> God, it's really terrifying that big. <laughs> Let's get rid of that. So, a uh, little bit about me. I am. Um, a uh, so, I work for Mailchimp. How many people know who Mailchimp is? How many people get DevOps Weekly? Then you know what the fuck Mailchimp is. Um, so, yeah, I work at Mailchimp. We have. Uh, uh, an interesting role in that we have staff engineers who are focused on operations. Um, after doing this for over 20 years, I kind of earned the right to not have a pager, I think. So um, basically my, my role there is, is more of an advisory one around technology decisions, architecture, things like that, um, which is not to say I don't get my hands dirty and write code, but I do. Um, I think uh, uh, most people would be not familiar with me but so much as Lucis, which is where I am, like everywhere, Twitter and things like that. There's a picture of my kid when he was like, one of my kids when he was three years old as my avatar and it's not changed in a very long time. <laughs> um, so yeah, I used to be on the DevOps Days organizing list uh, team along with Chris and some other things and um, married kids, uh, you know, things like that. And I'm pretty opinionated, which comes out now and then. All right, so who's ready for a story? Yeah. All right, story time. I have kids, I tell stories. 2011, I was at DevOps Days Mountain View on a panel about orchestration. I, I uh, had written a tool that some people liked, um, and I made this statement, configuration management is a solved problem. <laughs> well, at the end of the panel, Andrew got up and said, <laughs> nope. Um, he actually said it much nicer than that, and he has ribbed me to that day. These pictures are from that actual one, so I was kind of happy. Um, so, you know, I kind of overstepped when I said that, in that when I said that, again, this is 2011, and we're what, 2017? So that math says six, yeah, six years. Um, the tools do what they say they're going to do on the 10, right? Um, not everything really fits into CM, so com complaining that CM is not solved for something that doesn't fit in configuration management worldview isn't a fault of the configuration management tool. And uh, past performance is no guarantee of future results. So I wasn't predicting anything there. Um, but obviously it's not a solved problem. How many people do we have here today? A shitload? Yeah, okay. So that's actually in, in met metric fuck ton on this side of the pond. Um, no, so we, obviously everyone is here. It's not a solved problem. It's not a, um, it's not a forgotten thing. So here's the secret, though. Services are what matter, not necessarily the servers. Um, I, I say that a lot because in the end, uh, the, the machine, unless it's providing a service, if we think about machine in the abstract, the server, it, it's really not doing anything. I guess there might be some, you know, some things that are valuable, but, um, but, but we still have servers that we have to configure. Uh, this individual in the background is one of my coworkers. He has a very pensive look as he's looking at a rack of servers, and I thought it was appropriate. All right, so this is my scientific study here. Um, using conf when you use configuration management, um, it, like whatever the tool is, again, I don't care about the tool. Um, my, my theory and thought, and I'd like some validation to make me feel special and loved, that these are the things that you mostly use it for. And, I mean, is this like, does this feel like 90% of everyone's use case? Who has like an, a use case that doesn't fit in this that you try to use it for? Anything specific? Deployment. What's that? Deployment. So deployment in general, but is your deployment made up of packages? Adding a user, or is it? Okay. JavaScript? 
Okay. So I don't know. This is how I feel about it. I tend to want to say these are the, like, this is the 80, 90% model. I mean, we provision a server, we throw some shit on it. Um, I originally called that services on the second line, and somebody at work said, well, since you just said services are the only thing that are important, maybe you should call it something else. Oh, daemons, that makes sense. Okay, um, that's probably a better fit. Um, but templates, files, and users. So um, in general, I feel like these things are handled better by some, not necessarily NIH bespoke, like, you know, this is our Haskell-based Rust transpiler that puts applications on a server. Like, not that customized, but um, th things like orchestration, I'm going to skip over that because I'm really opinionated on what that means and I don't think I want to get into that right now. Um, but ALM type stuff, uh, so some people, who, who was it who said they use it for releases? They use their CM for releases? Okay, so, you know, in some cases people do that if, um, if it fits, if they can make it fit, I think. Um, secrets management, things like Vault or an HSM, I don't necessarily... I know that Chef has some, some stuff built in, and obviously people using in, um, Hira with encrypted uh, EYAML type stuff and stuff like that. I don't, I'm talking about like proper secrets management, not just I need to store some passwords in, in my tools. Um, and things like binary distribution. How many people have heard of something called Artifactory? How many people like Artifactory? Okay, wow. I, I love it. Um, I, like I said, I'm pretty opinionated, so... Uh, Artifactory is one of those things that I, I think, I, I don't use Puppet's file server if I can help it. I don't, you know, there are certain things that I don't feel like, I would rather have, you know, Lighty uh, running and just serving a directory than try to serve files through some tool that's doing a bunch of other shit. So, um, that, when I talk about binary distribution, I think like, I don't necessarily want Chef to have a, a Docker endpoint in it, right? <laughs> that's not, so that's where I'm getting at with that. So I, that's why I say it's, these things are arguably handled by a better tool. Those are the kind of things I'm talking about, so. All right, now that I have framed the scope of my, um, my thought leadering on this, um, they, they told me keynotes are supposed to be very thought leadery and future, future looking, right? So um, now that if we framed it in those, those terms, uh, what, what do I think that we're still missing, or what does a, we'll say next gen, you know, gen 12 CM kind of thing look like? All right, this one. Uh, where's James, is he, we already talked last night. <laughs> um, active enforcement, uh, who has an idea what I'm talking about here? Besides you. <laughs> Go for it, yeah. Bingo. That is, so I wrote a blog post. I do this a lot when I either drink and or get mad. Um, and this one was basically inspired by this tweet from Cliff. Um, obviously he is talking, he's mentioned a couple of tools specifically here, but the general idea is the same. And, the, and it essentially deals with things like uh, configuration drift. So this is what we do now. Um, hey, you look, Puppet's running. Oh, this file's wrong, I'm gonna fix it. Now Puppet's not running, and then we have a gap of however long that Puppet hasn't been running, or Chef hasn't been running. There's, no, there's nothing going on, and meanwhile that file could be changed. Um, that file could go away. You know, hopefully you, shit would break, you'd know when that happens, but um, what if it's something that has, uh, you know, that's things like sensitive credentials or an error, or it's a you know, password file, adding a user. Anyway, state is, can change in between CM runs. That's why we do our CM runs to make things consistent. Um, I would like to see something that does this, that actively responds to a change happening on this system. Hey. Well, hey, do you too. Um, whoops, let me turn that over. Uh, um, you know, actively responds to things changing. Hey, Google. And what's that? Hey, Google. Yeah. Um, actually, I think I'm, I'm, I'll tell you in a minute. Um, <laughs> because I don't want it to be abused in the middle of a talk. <laughs> uh, 
So anyway, can we create a system that can respond to or optionally prevent anything that doesn't uh, conform to our CM policy? Now remember, this is back to core competency and what we consider the focus. So we have things like FS events uh, is on, on Mac, um, KQ, I notified. I put Dbus and Kbus in here. Um, I'm going to keep my opinions to myself on Kbus and things like that. But it's, it's not a bad model. And technically, you could publish file change events across Kbus or something like that. I mean, it's not there now. But um, who's, who's familiar with DM Verity? Who, who's worked with CoreOS? So DM Verity is something that CoreOS people put out that's essentially an overlay device mapper kind of deal. Um, but again, essentially, but do you really want to have to go in and register uh, watches or hooks for every file that configuration management, your tool, is responsible for? Um, I notify would literally explode if you did that. Um, so again, if, remember, we're talking about core competency here. The core competency of the tool, if we figure or assume that the things that we want to manage are a list of fixed things, then it is, it is possible. Um, you know, so maybe we need uh, some stuff like this in the Linux kernel, for instance. Uh, who's, who's used libnetfilterq? Who's familiar with it? So basically, you can inject user space calls into the netfilter stack. So like, hey, I've got a packet. Let me defer the decision or about it to user land and then come back. I mean, that's, you know, obviously you want the thing that's doing that to be a very efficient code base, but that's not to say that it can't be done. Um, so I'm just wondering if maybe we could get something like that in the kernel for files because, um, you know, I don't need another init system. I didn't need the one that we have now. Um, that's one thing I'm very opinionated on, but I won't say it by name. So, uh, yeah, so I'm just thinking ahead, you know, like what if there is a mechanism, again, and maybe there is, maybe I'm, I'm not aware of it, maybe I missed it in my research of current state. That, that the kernel can notify about things in a way that your CM can register things to have that happen. So that's, that's kind of the thought there. All right. Um, we use the word compile very loosely in the CM world. We don't actually compile shit. We just, you know, parse it. Um, so <laughs> so uh, thinking about this, so I wrote a gist, again, it was either drunk or angry, and I wrote something. Um, this is the general idea. This is something I, I think might be interesting as a next-gen kind of thing. So um, how many people have used Go or Rust? Compile time is pretty fast. Um, nice zero-dependency binary. It's kind of neat. So I thought it would be interesting is if we had, um, so we need, may need a server component for this, but the idea that we actually do compile something and send it to the server where, or the client where this, where this config management run is, ha is, is happening. So, uh, you know, maybe I write my little whatever DSL code base I have locally, I publish it, maybe it's just straight Go or maybe it's straight Rust. You know, I publish it to my CI server which says, oh, this catalog has changed. I need to rebuild a binary for every server that this might apply to. And then when the client checks in, either, you know, that binary is shipped down, maybe there's some P2P thing. Hell, maybe for clients that are fresh, you know, that haven't come in, um, the binary is compiled on the fly based on some information. Um, I, it's, it's a really weird kind of thought. I didn't really have, um, you know, a lot of, it's a gist, right? So I only really write so much. But I, I kind of like the idea of type safety in general. And I like the idea of knowing that my run is going to fail actually before I even try it. Um, I think that's good. And, you know, obviously if we deal with the state drift issue, that's, that's not as big of a, you know, that could be an issue. But anyway, that's, it's kind of a thought there around, I guess, you know, true binary uh, configuration management or compiled catalogs. All right. This is my last one. Um, distributed CM. So... Uh, ChefConf, uh, very first one, I was talking to Jason over at Fastly, and he had uh, been talking about um, the idea that 
a lot of people, they, you know, in some cases, people weren't comfortable dealing with Chef Server at the time as a single point of failure. Uh, this was pre the big rewrite. Hey. Um, and so, you know, what, we, what about if we could, could do something um, without, uh, without the server having to be up, right? So, I should probably solve that real quick. Da, 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 da. So that was um, Twitter. <laughs> That's why I didn't want to tell anybody until I turned it off. Um, so the you know the idea is you have your CM server right, like whatever this server component is, um, and it goes down. This shit happens, right? You know. We like to think that that's not a critical issue, but it can be, um, you know, especially if your deploys are tied to whatever your configuration management tool is. Let's say it's not something that does a solo kind of standalone run. Um, then that means that affects your business agility and, and things can't run. So uh, what if you had a state where uh, instead of the central server, you had a peer ring of services. Now, how many people have used Habitat or dealt with Habitat supervisor? Okay, not a lot, outside of chef people. Um, yeah, <laughs> the point is the, the Habitat supervisor works very similar to this model um, where that things are in a service ring, essentially, a peer group, and um, you know, they, they publish, they, they, they coordinate between them but what if there was a way that this worked for outside of the service state? Maybe it was you know, a peer group's uh, knowing about a, a given file or a given user that needed to be on the system and they enforced it that way. Um, and if that's the case, if you've got something like that working, would you even need a central authority? Um, you know, what, if, what if there was, again, a, like a P2P ring, essentially, uh, that, that services kept you know, files on and shared those with for that, that kind of thing? Um, and then, then we get really, really screwed when we start thinking about stuff like this. So I said, you know, services matter, not servers. Um, how many people have run CoreOS? Anyway, yeah, there's, 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 it's, there's not a server to run in that sense, right? It's not a traditional model. Um, Atomic is the same way. Um, obviously, Docker, 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 Docker. That, that confuses things even more. Um, uh, what is the Ubuntu project that's very similar to Do Snappy? Is that, what's that? LXD. Yeah, LXD, they have their thing. Um, uh, so, and then, you know, obviously in the middle we've got, you know, serverless in the strictest sense, uh, which I hate the word, but, you know, you've got Lambda and tools like functions of a, as a service that change what a service is, the, the definition of a service. So that um, can, can kind of mess with your, your thought process. So. Uh, I don't have answers for these. I, I, if people do, I would love to hear them. Um, you know, does it is it important that we control the inner workings of Core OS? Do we feel comfortable letting go of that? Um, do we feel you know how do we? How many people came to wonder today or to talk about how to deploy Docker stuff with configuration management? Or how many people are doing that? You know, how, to, what, to what extent are you doing that? So are you, are you controlling which Docker containers run with Puppet or Chef? Are you actually running that inside of your Docker container? Like, are you running Chef inside of Docker? You deploy containers by Okay. So, you know, these are, Docker really complicated the, situa complicated the situation, so um, I'd like to talk to some folks about that myself. Um, are there any other... Does anybody else have any experience with these and how it applies to specifically to what we're talking about at Config Management Camp as a, as a whole? So. All right, so um, I always include pictures of my kids in slides, and I find the most absurd ones I can. So um, I don't know how much time we have. I haven't been keeping track. So does anybody have any questions or comments, rude remarks, insults, threats? I'm sure James is waiting to jump up and down. <laughs> Would you tell us a <laughs> Here, you know what? Um, we don't have a wireless mic, do we? We don't have a wireless. Okay. 
Can you yell really loud for the people at home? Um, I have many, many questions, but I'll start with one. <laughs> he has many, many questions, but he's going to start with one. <laughs> So the, the question was for folks who couldn't hear, I think we have you know, the secondary room and obviously. Um, so thinking about things like rollout strategies and, and um, either blue-green or percentage-based rollouts, um, if you had a system like, like the first one is, I was talking about with the active enforcement, how do you guarantee that that doesn't blow all your shit up at once, right? Um, I don't have an answer for that. Um, I, that's an interesting one. I hadn't thought about that particular case. Um, I would, I would say, again, if we focus, if we limit the scope of where we do this, maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe you always want that user to be there regardless, and that's okay, but if it's a, you know, if it's something that has the potential to blow up or you want that greater control, I, I don't have an answer. Um, uh, I, I, that's an interesting, an interesting concern, though. Um, what... I guess you would have that problem even with non-application code. Maybe a kernel parameter that you tuned or something, you don't want to blow it up, so. Yeah. Okay, so that's, that's a, you know, does this, how does this fit with the, the canary model? So, any other questions? Is anything? Comments? I thought it was cool. <laughs> so the question was, what is the advantage of having the ring? Um, I, I don't know that there's anything specifically advantageous about saying, you know, oh, we have this masterless distributed thing. Um, obviously, distributed systems are harder to troubleshoot, and it's a problem. Um, I just honestly wanted to think about it. I, I don't, you know, I, 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 was a, I am a big fan of the model that Habitat uses for its supervisor. <laughs> And I, I think that that model can be expanded safely with limited scope. I mean, it makes sense for an init system where, you know, these systems know the state of each other, right? Um, orchestration's always been kind of a, a fun spot for me to play in. So uh, anything, you know, when you think about that, I like the idea of, of things being able to fix themselves. So if there's, if there's a way that you can make this small group of systems in some capacity aware of each other and they can solve their own problems, you know, that's kind of what I was thinking there. So it's, it's less thing to get paged about, quite honestly. Or maybe it's more. Yes? Um, yeah, you gave a pretty tight um, definition of conflict management. <laughs> Um, well, what's your thought on sort of the integration that people need between you know, the, the core config management and all the ancillary tools that you actually need to, to make stuff work? So, so give me an example of an auxiliary tool that you're thinking of. Like the, the binary distribution stuff you talked about, right? Like you know, to track how, how stuff flows from the CI onto systems, where, you know, which systems have what on Okay, so you're talking about what this... Um, so ask your question again so I can get it exactly right for everyone when I re-say it. Because um, you said I had a very tight definition of CM. Yeah. And how does it... How, how, do you, how do you see, you know, what integration do you see people need between you know, the, the core function management and you know, ancillary tools that, that you actually need to have sort of an end-to-end -end workflow of, of what you're trying to do? Like inside of what you're actually doing. But I mean, the, so the auxiliary tools that we use now, like, um, how do people canary their stuff? Like, or how do they run? Do we run Jenkins, you know, or things like that? Do you consider that a auxiliary tool in this case, um, or or things like in the Chef World, Test Kitchen, um, and stuff like that? I don't think that changes any of it. I mean, those things are still there. Um, you know, the reason I did such a tight definition of CM is because I, I legitimately think we have abused what we use 
our configuration management tools for because it had the word configuration and the word management. And so it seemed to fit everything. Um, I have generally backed off of what I'm using those tools for to have those specific things I mentioned because it feels it's less to worry about in my mind. Like I don't have to worry about um, you know changes between versions of a CM tool for the basic resources. In general, they work. So in terms of the auxiliary tooling and things like that, I don't know that there is that changes. Um, I mean, I don't see why, you know, if we had this binary CM model that that couldn't just be done with Jenkins in some way. You know, whether it pushes, you know, you commit to a repo and it, it pushes up. So does that, does that answer your question or am I, okay, I want to make sure I got it, got it right. So I don't see that it changes anything because people have their own tools. I mean, some people use Vim, some people use Emacs, right? So. Um, those Emacs people are weird. Yes? So on your first point where you're wanting immediate configuration repair, um, I generally see people messing with machines that are managed with configuration management as a management problem, like people problem, like stop logging into machines and doing crazy stuff. So is that what you're trying to solve? Or what, um, like, have you been unable to get people to stop logging into so the the question was for people didn't hear is um, was the impetus for the active enforcement people who can't stop SSHing to servers and actually it wasn't, although it is a valid use case. It is my concern is that we rely on um, our configuration management tool to configure the server the way that we consider it to be secure. These users, these services, these files. If that gets changed, and if any of that changes, we are technically insecure until configuration management runs again, depending on our definition of secure. If we've defined that, you know, deleting these users off the system and somebody adds them back for whatever reason, it could be malicious, it could be accidental, that is the primary use case I had. Um, you know, we've had tools around for a long time like Sawin and tripwire and things like that, but they are still, even in that case, they don't actively prevent anything. They're just reporting in that case. Um, I actually, you know, we, we define our policy about what permissions a file should have. It should only be, re, you know, root, root own, root read kind of situation. You know, we define that somewhere in Chef or Puppet or any of these, any of our tools, it doesn't matter. It could be a text file. I don't care. The, those, that, that enforcement doesn't happen until something makes it happen. I just, I like the idea of a little bit more secure world where it doesn't happen, it doesn't change because something is preventing it based on a policy that's defined. So, all right. <laughs> Did I answer your question? I'm sorry. So, yeah. As to the SSH problem, I've always liked to charge people money for SSHing to servers, like a quarter jar or a euro jar. I don't know what it is. Uh, let me get, James had a question. I think, James, you, really quick, and then we'll. So the question was where I said that certain tasks or functions are better handled by <coughs> arguably, I used arguably in there, because I'm actually, um, I, I, do I feel like that should be handled by another tool separate actually or expand the definition of config management? I think other tools. I, I think, again, Unix model, pits and pieces, pipe together, you know, pipe fitters union kind of thing. Um, that is, that is, uh, I think that is the case because I, I don't think that 
Okay, I, I didn't want to do this. Let's use systemd as an example. <laughs> this, is, this is all going downhill very, very fast. <laughs> um, did I think systemd needed a name server? Fuck, no, but it has one. That is the, the fear I have of expanding a CM tool, right? Is that stay true to what you are, your core competency. What are you good at? Get those things right first. If, if the community or the, your ecosystem feels like this is something the tool should adopt, then absolutely adopt it, but make it a core competency. Don't make it a, a secondary thing. Um, don't make it a, a stepchild of, the, of your primary tool functionality. So in general, I say let, let tools that have a better core competency do that. You know, um, whether you, you know, Bind might actually have solved a lot of problems with DNS security. But anyway, so does that answer your question? I think, I, I'm, I think a separate tool for now with the idea that um, commonly defined interfaces used between the tools in some way, so. And then, I love that. okay. So I've been following James' work um, for quite a while and now also Habitat's. Um, and it struck me that when you, when you, uh, when you said something, we are now finally closing in uh, on the kind of cluster management that VMS had like 20 years ago with, with all the tooling that we have built from scratch. <coughs> I, I, maybe that's a good thing. I don't know. <laughs> did, did we actually learn something from VMS? <laughs> I don't. What's that? Everything is a VMS role. All right. Well, um, do we have any any other questions or comments? I think we're way over time, and I apologize because I think I'm holding up potty oh, breaks and coffee and tea. We're running into a break. Okay. And Hannah, I'm holding up your time. Right. I don't have any questions on Twitter either. So. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. <laughs> My wife will be so happy. <laughs> <laughs>